All right. I think we've, I think we've hit a, a critical mass of, of folks that are, are joining us this, uh, this morning and this afternoon, depending where you are. So actually, it is a good, a good morning, especially in Washington, for those who are waking up uh, to, this, uh, to this virtual event. Uh, on behalf of the German Marshall Fund in the United States, GMF's Balkans Trust for Democracy, GMF's Ankara Office, and GMF's Frontlines of Democracy, we want to welcome you to today's conversation with Deputy Assistant Secretary Matthew Palmer. Matt, welcome. Uh, great to see you. My Thanks, name is Jonathan Kath. I'm a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund. I also direct GMF's Frontlines of Democracy initiative. I'm here today with my colleagues, uh, the Balkans Trust Director, Gordana Delch, and GMF's Ankara Director, Uzgur Unlu Hisachikli. Uh, and we're, we're really pleased to have you here today joining us. Before we dive in, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, by now, I know everyone is, is intimately familiar with Zoom, but I thought that I would just uh, make certain that everybody knows the ground rules and some housekeeping rules. Uh, please note this event is on the record. During the event, you're going to only see the speakers on the screen. They won't see you. Um, and everyone except for the speakers will be muted. We'll have a Q&A session following opening statements. If you look at the top of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. I think somebody's already posed a question even before I said, go ahead and pose a question. But if you look at the top of your screen, you'll see a Q&A uh, button. And throughout this entire uh, event, please feel free to put your questions up there. Uh, you know, we encourage you to pose it at any point in time. Uh, before we start this morning, and I really want to turn uh, to Matt. Um, for those who don't know Matt, you, he is a senior diplomat at the State Department, U.S. State Department. He's held numerous uh, posts um, at the State Department right now. He is areas resp area responsibilities from the Western Balkans uh, to the Aegean region. Um, he's also the special advisor for the Western Balkans as well. So he's wearing multiple hats and leadership roles. <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to work with Matt in various capacities over, over the last several years. Um, we're really pleased to have you here. Not only is he a, an accomplished diplomat, but also an author as well, too. I can make a plug for people to go ahead and, and, and look at some of the books that you've written as well. And we're really just pleased that you could be here today because you, uh, Matt, you, uh, obviously there's the COVID-19 challenge, which is impacting not only the United States, economically, politically, socially, uh, but you are working in a region that <coughs> has had many challenges even before COVID-19. You have NATO allies and partners, and we're talking about the Western Balkans, uh, to Turkey, to Cyprus, Greece, uh, in a region where you have a diverse set of actors uh, with historic relationships and challenges from migration to economic issues, uh, to the challenges of, of malign interference in these regions. <clears throat> so I wanted to bring you in. I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a cold, uh, but wanted to bring you in to talk a little bit at first about what's going on. And I think most people are really interested to hear how the U.S. is responding uh, to uh, COVID-19 externally. I've, we've had the opportunity uh, at GMF to work very closely with USAID in support of democracy and governance, and also in terms of response to COVID-19. Uh, so there's a lot happening uh, from the U.S. to help partners. And I really first wanted to pose to you the question about how the United States is supporting and engaging partners uh, in the region during this time, because I think there's also a real challenge of disinformation, uh, whether it's uh, Kremlin disinformation or that of Beijing, uh, but also um, since it's such a diverse uh, set of countries that you work with and that the United States is engaged in, um, and I know this is a high priority region for the United States for a number of reasons, security, economic, political. I really wanted to talk to you about such a, such a difficult moment, how the U.S. is continuing to engage uh, in the region on difficult challenges from Serbia and Kosovo to the challenges faced uh, in Turkey, including in Syria, uh, to the challenges of um, how do you, uh, how does the United States as other actors are trying to influence this region in spaces like Montenegro or North Macedonia? How does the United States continue to engage 
And one thing that I'm struck by is from looking at what you're writing and talking about is the United States really remains fully engaged, just as if you did prior to COVID-19, the same challenges, the same focus are there. But I want to really sort of hand it over to you to talk about um, what those strategic priorities are right now for the United States, but really also this response. And I just want to applaud you and, and the diplomats at the State Department, plus your, your colleagues over uh, working at USAID and other departments and agencies that continue to engage daily to support and advance U.S. interests, but also to support partners, uh, particularly at a time when uh, countries are, gonna, are struggling economically, uh, are struggling with health challenges from COVID-19, and, uh, and undoubtedly, uh, there's going to be fallout uh, for some time from what's taken place. And hopefully at the end of the day, uh, the U.S. and our partners in the region, which we didn't bring up, our transatlantic partners, which are critical to the work that's being done, whether it's in the Balkans or the critical partnership with a country like Turkey or Greece um, as NATO partners, um, they're also brought into this factor. So I'm throwing a lot at you right now, and it's, it's a region that probably can't be covered in the short period that we have today. And we just really thank you for being here. Uh, and I think everybody wants to hear from you and wants to hear uh, your thoughts on these issues. And so we'll start with you first, and then we'll come back to our trust, trust director, Gordana, and then to Oscar and Ankara. And, uh, but Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and thank you, Gordana and Osgur, for, for being here today as well. This is an important topic. Um, and I look forward to, to talking through issues of interest to, to all of you and to the others that are, are on this call. But let me open up with just a few broad thoughts about the, the region. And, and I think I would begin with highlighting that this region, both the Western Balkans and the broader Aegean region, has been navigating the COVID-19 crisis quite well on balance. This is a region that has risen to the challenge. It is a region that has uh, really, I think, been, been a, a success story, uh, certainly in comparison to some parts of the world, some parts of Europe, that have been quite hard hit by this. Greece, for example, has been held up as a potential model for how to do this. It has been uh, quite effective. They got in early. Uh, they put in place uh, uh, processes and, and rules and procedures that were effective in controlling and containing the spread of the virus. Montenegro has become the first European country to declare itself free of COVID-19. Uh, these are significant achievements, and they are achievements that were built in no small part on a foundation, an institutional foundation, that the United States has helped build over the last 20 years. We've invested billions of dollars in building up institutions, in building up uh, cap capability and capacity, and it's on that foundation that governments have been in a position to respond effectively. Some of the assistance that the United States has provided over the years has provided very direct support in responding to the, the COVID-19 challenge. As just one example, much of the testing for uh, the virus is in, in Cyprus is done at the Cyprus Institute of Neurology and Genetics. This is an organization that was established with $10 million in U.S. support back in the 90s, and it's paying dividends now in terms of providing the institutional capability and capacity for the Republic of Cyprus to respond to this virus. In the Western Balkans, we've invested billions of dollars in uh, promoting good governance, transparency, accountability, the rule of law. These, this is the foundation upon which governments in the region are able to muster an effective response to the virus. I, I think it's also important to highlight the role that the United States has played, continues to play, and will play in the future. Uh, in supporting the work of multilateral and international institutions. And I think here in particular of organizations like the UNHCR, the International Office of Migration, uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. This is the, the core of the global response, not just in the Western Balkans and the Aegean, uh, but across Europe and in some cases around the world in the United States has been a, a huge net contributor to these institutions and these organizations. Uh, in the Western Balkans itself, um, just in response to the COVID-19 crisis, the United States has put forward some $20 million in direct support uh, to the countries in the Balkans. That goes to 
to providing sanitation equipment and reagents and testing capability. Uh, we've provided material support to individual member states. One of the first demonstrations of international support for Bosnia-Herzegovina was a Yukon plane landing at the airport in Sarajevo, providing uh, assistance, including uh, disinfecting kits for the uh, military of Bosnia-Herzegovina. That was a demonstration of solidarity, not just on the part of the United States, but on the part of, of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So I could go down the list of, of individual programs and projects that the United States has supported across the region, but I'm not sure that that's the best use of this time. Just really to underscore that, that we've put money forward, we've put material forward, we've put political capital forward in helping and assisting the countries of the Western Balkans and the Aegean respond to these challenges. In Greece and Turkey, we've provided considerable assistance to support um, migrants uh, and refugees and the work in particular of UNHCR and, and IOM. We looked at these as particularly vulnerable populations. We also considered migrants and refugees to be important potential vectors of the disease. So providing that kind of support is providing also support to the, the broader Greek and Turkish community as they manage the challenge of uh, hosting significant refugee and migrant populations in a time of a global pandemic. This is not a problem that can be addressed alone. It's not a problem that any one nation state can deal with without cooperation with, with others. The virus is disinterested in borders. The virus is disinterested in politics. The virus is interested in propagating itself. And only together and collectively are we going to be in a position to respond effectively. We've been heartened by certain demonstrations of a cooperative spirit. I think here in particular of the ways in which Serbia and Kosovo have been able to put aside political differences, work together in support of providing assistance across borders to facilitate the, the movement of medical personnel and equipment and uh, humanitarian supplies, including food, through the Green Lane Initiative that I think is a, is a huge success for the entire Balkan region. Uh, this is something the United States is committed to supporting. And going forward, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Green Lane Initiative uh, will outlast the pandemic. Uh, and it will serve actually as a basis for promoting the kind of trade and interchange and commerce that will help knit this all too often fractious region together. There are challenges, there are tensions. Uh, the United States is committed to working in partnership with uh, the countries of the region. We're committed to working in partnership with our European partners and allies in supporting the growth and development of the Western Balkans and their integration into the broader European family of nations. Uh, in the Aegean, we are committed to deepening and strengthening our existing partnerships and our alliance relationships. We're looking at the Eastern Mediterranean as a coherent strategic space in which the United States is competing for positive influence against other great powers. The Russians are there, the Chinese are there, in the Eastern Mediterranean specifically, the Iranians are there. And we understand this as competition. And the United States is committed to this. We are committed to building on these relationships, to deepening partnerships, to deepening the cooperation that we enjoy with these countries that are important partners and allies for the United States, demonstrating that we're there for the long term and that the region benefits from greater US involvement and engagement. And I think what I will do is, is stop there and, and I'm happy to take this conversation in whatever direction you and the other participants would, would like to take it. Yeah, Matt, thank you for that. Thank you for the, um, for the, for the broad overview and <clears throat> I think your last point on this long-term commitment is particularly important, um, and I know in the region, and that's what you guys are working towards on a daily basis to try to convey convey that. But I'm also struck by the the amount of competition that um, you know from others that are are taking place in the region. Not struck that they're there because they've been there, uh, but but this is a particularly difficult moment because of of the economic uh, train wreck that COVID-19 is, is really exposing every country to at this moment. So if I can, I'm gonna bring Gordana in. Uh, and Gordana, we're gonna move to the Q&A uh, por portion of the, of the conversation. 
And, and again, for those that are joining, please, um, the Q&A button may be on the top or the bottom or the side of your page. Please use that to, to pose uh, your question. I did receive some questions before the event, which we'll try to get to as well. Gordana, can I send it over to you just for a quick comment and, and sort of initial question? And then we'll, co we'll go over to Oscar and Ankara to ask uh, questions from his end. So Gordana, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. And hi, Matt. So good to see you again. Um, well, Matt has really given um, a wonderful review, basically, of the US involvement here in the region. Uh, what I would like to just underline probably here is the fact that the COVID-19 uh, indeed did not only reveal uh, some of the problems that were maybe put under the carpet, but even accelerated them. Uh, and what we have been worried um, here is precisely what Jonathan, you touched upon, and that is the, um, the input, uh, so to say, or the meddling of the illiberal forces that have used the void that was created in the, uh, specifically in the month uh, of March. And I'm mostly here talking about China. Now, the other thing that that we are worried about is the lack of the prospects of the EU enlargement. And I guess that my question for Matt here would be, would US, regardless of the elections, you know, um, and the result of the upcoming US elections, would US reconsider the way it is involved uh, um, with this region, with the Western Balkans, or let's say even the whole of the Southeast Europe maybe, and not look at it only through um, um, the enlargement because what was policy of the US government towards this region was basically the EU enlargement. And if we, if we are frank and say that this prospect is really far away, if, if anywhere on a horizon, then perhaps we should reconsider the way uh, how US is involved uh, in this region. And the other thing what I would like to say is the fact that um, I have noticed that, for example, some of the U.S. Um, uh, companies have withdrawn from China, and I would, you know, use this opportunity to maybe invite them to rethink uh, whether they would like to invest in this region, and that would be one of really good and solid bridges to strengthen the friendship between U.S. Um, and this region. So that's from me. Excellent. Thank you for that, Gordana. Um, let, let, let me, if I may, deal first with the issue of enlargement and the prospects for enlargement, because I do think one of the good news stories over the last couple of months is the fact that there has been some significant steps forward on the uh, EU enlargement front and on the uh, Euro-Atlantic integration front. Uh, even in the month of March, which was the low point for so many European countries, uh, the European Council was in a position to make really a historic decision to open the session negotiations with both North Macedonia and Albania. That was something that the United States had strongly advocated for, that we had strongly encouraged. It really, I think, went a long way towards addressing the, uh, the frictions that had been generated by the failure of the European Council to make that same decision last October. Um, it's important for charting a path forward, in particular, for implementation of the PRESPA agreement between North Macedonia and Greece. It should accelerate the process of reforms in uh, Albania, provide incentives for them to tackle the, the challenges of, of crime and corruption. So I, I think that's really a, a positive news story. And in fact, it was within 24 or 36 hours that, that North Macedonia not only uh, got the green light for the opening of accession negotiations, but became the 30th member of NATO. Uh, that's a, a huge achievement. March 27th, I think, will be a day that is engraved in the history books of North Macedonia. And that happened at the height of the pandemic. So it's a, a significant positive step forward in terms of ways that the United States may need to nuance its approach to the region, given that I think we all understand the process of European integration will be a long-term process is going to take quite quite some time. Um, I do think that we have been putting time, effort, political capital into supporting integration, uh, economic integration of the countries of the Western Balkans through both existing mechanisms such as 
um, SEFTA uh, and the RCC, but also through new initiatives like the Mini Schengen Initiative that has the uh, additional merit of being homegrown in, in the region. Uh, the Green Lanes Initiative is another example of this, ways in which we're looking to promote uh, common economic space. In terms of attracting U.S. businesses to the Balkans, that's been, you know, a long time effort on, on our part to uh, create opportunities for American business. There's, I think, something of a misconception across the region that the United States government can direct U.S. business where to invest, that we're going to pick up the phone and say, hey, um, IBM, if you're shutting down in China, maybe you could open up in, in North Macedonia. Of course, that's not the way business works, but, but American business will go where there is opportunity. And what we've done is we've worked to support and to facilitate an environment that is conducive to that kind of investment, an environment in which there is transparency and accountability and predictability and the rule of law. And that is an environment that will be very attractive to American business. Those businesses that have invested in the Balkans have been pretty happy so far with, with the experience. And now you can see some of them giving back, that they are, are providing support and assistance to the countries that, that have been their, their hosts and their partners. Uh, Coca-Cola, I know, has put some, some real money on the table in, in providing COVID relief and COVID support and assistance. That's the kind of, of generosity and reciprocity that the countries of the Western Balkans can and should expect from American business. So, Yes, the United States government is committed to this region. Uh, we are committed to partnering with American business and we look forward to partnering, furthering to deepen the partnership that we have with the countries of the region to create a climate and an environment that will be conducive to that kind of investment. Do I have Jonathan? Um, go go for I, it. If you, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, um, thank you, Matt. And speaking of the conducive environment, um, one of the things also that um, our listeners and viewers would like to know is precisely um, the environment um, and how conducive it is. So we obviously have in this region many, uh, whether bilateral or multilateral issues that need to, that need to be resolved. So one of the things that um, everybody's wondering these days is the negotiations between Pristina and Belgrade. Um, there is often talk about a deadline being um, October, uh, that something needs to be done and something needs to be on paper prior to the US elections. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, what kind of agreement would be that the US government would back up uh, support. Um, and given also the fact that we have lately heard that in, even Germans um, are aware of the fact that they might be isolated in their view of not uh, accepting any border change and that maybe some other uh, leaders and some other Europe European countries are considering that as a possibility, uh, depending on how the, um, the negotiations and the dialogue uh, goes on. So what is the stand of the U.S. administration and how much would the U.S. elections actually um, impact the dialogue between Pristina and, uh, and Belgrade? And let's say uh, if Biden, for example, wins the elections, would that dramatically change the, the, the stand of the current uh, U.S. administration vis-a-vis -vis this problem? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Go to the only about half of which I'm going to talk about. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves here. The United States continues to support the full normalization of the relationship between Belgrade and Pristina. We would we see this as essential for opening up the European path for for both countries. But there's there's a lot of work to do right now. Kosovo needs a government. Um, we're waiting for a ruling from the Constitutional Court uh, that, that should open up a, a path forward to uh, addressing and resolving the issues that surround government formation. I want to underscore that the United States is, is not seeking to influence that process in any way. We're not seeking to pick Kosovo's next government. We're not playing favorites. We're not picking sides. What we do want to see is a process that is founded firmly on the Kosovo constitution and the Kosovo legal framework 
that that produces a government that is representative and one that is empowered to engage in this dialogue process. Um, in terms of all the other stuff, the the deadlines and the electoral stuff, I, I, I got nothing for you on that. But but we are kind of a piece at a time trying to help the parties move forward to resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Matt, thank, thank you for answering that. I'm going to turn over to Osger now. We're going to shift uh, some, some of the regional focus. Um, and Osger, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, and uh, thank you, Matt, for very interesting opening remarks. Uh, before asking my questions, uh, I would like to present a point of view. Uh, except for uh, conspiracy theorists, I think none of us, none of us believe uh, that this was a biological attack. But if it, if it was a biological terrorist attack, it's almost exactly uh, what it would look like. And this means that uh, none of our individual countries, uh, nor were we uh, as a transatlantic community or the global family, uh, let's say, ready for this. So we still are not uh, ready uh, for a biological terrorist attack uh, to come uh, in the future. Uh, I believe that uh, this is a very important aspect. And uh, we should, if we have not already started, we should start thinking about how we prepare uh, for uh, such an eventuality. Now, regarding uh, how U.S. response to COVID impacts Turkey, of course, uh, the situation in Turkey is a little bit di uh, different. Uh, Turkey is not uh, in need of uh, protective equipment or medical supplies, and Turkey has the institutions uh, to deal with the uh, COVID crisis uh, by itself, and uh, it's doing so uh, relatively fine. However, uh, having said this, the Turkish economy, uh, which was already badly damaged uh, before the pandemic, uh, is in very bad shape now. Uh, the, the IMF uh, forecasts 5% uh, contraction in 2020. We are not yet uh, in a currency crisis, but we could well be uh, in, a, in a couple of months, weeks, uh, or uh, maybe days. Uh, and this is where Turkey has uh, reached out to the United States, uh, asking for a swap deal uh, between the Turkish uh, Central Bank and the uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, most people in Turkey uh, who are uh, listening to us now or could read the media uh, tomorrow are wondering where we stand uh, regarding a potential swap deal uh, between Turkey and the United States, or is there actually uh, no potential uh, for technical reasons uh, that would also be uh, important to know. And my second question uh, in a, in a uh, different area is, I mean, before the pandemic uh, broke out, uh, Tur the turkish us relationship uh, was in a, not, maybe not in a crisis mode, but was not in a very comfortable situation either. Uh, and I'm sure that Turkey was keeping Matt awake uh, at, at certain nights, I mean, uh, creating most of headache uh, for Matt. Uh, but so what has been uh, the impact of the pandemic on those issues? I mean, are they, are, they, are they now put in the deep freezer until the pandemic is over? Or are there still uh, developments going on on issues such as uh, the S-400s and uh, the Katsa sanctions or Turkey, the latest Turkish incursion to Syria or Libya? Uh, are there developments in those areas or shall we wait for uh, until the pandemic is over? Thank you for that. Well, it's good. I appreciate that. And you've, you've given me an opportunity to highlight another issue that I think it's important to put on the table, uh, which is the support that the United States has gotten from our partners across this region, both in the Balkans and in uh, the Aegean, not just what the United States has done for this region, but what the region has done for the United States. Turkey is an excellent example of this. The, the Turkish government uh, provided direct uh, assistance to the United States in the form of shipments of, uh, of PPE that were a gift uh, from Turkey to the American people. We're, we're grateful for that. Turkey has also been a provider of PPE on a commercial basis, a significant provider of things like um, face shields and medical grade gowns. Uh, and so we welcome and appreciate the ability uh, to deepen and strengthen our uh, commercial relationships in the area of PPE and, and elsewhere. In the Western Balkans, we've gotten assistance from uh, numerous Western Balkan countries in repatriating our citizens when things were, were difficult, including at, at no cost. Uh, the countries of the Western Balkans taking it upon themselves to provide uh, transportation for American citizens looking to get home. We're, we're grateful for that. We appreciate the partnership 
and understand that things flow, this kind of support flows in two directions. Uh, in terms of the, the Turkish economy, we think a strong Turkey is a strong partner for the United States. We want Turkey to have a solid economic foundation uh, upon which we can further deepen and strengthen our partnership. Uh, we've been talking about building on the existing commercial and trade relationship uh, to expand that up to, uh, I think the, the, uh, the goal of $100 billion has been bandied about. That is admittedly ambitious, uh, but the goal of strengthening, broadening the base of, of trade remains fundamental for the U.S.-Turkey partnership. On the specific issue of a swap line, I, I have nothing new for you. I don't know anything that, that you don't know. I know there have been conversations about this, not just between the central bank in Turkey and the Federal Reserve, but between uh, the bank in Turkey and, and other potential partners. Um, I understand why this is important to, to Turkish authorities. Uh, it's important for the United States that, that Turkey be on a strong, not just economic foundation, but a strong fiscal foundation. Uh, and again, a strong Turkish economy makes for a strong Turkey, makes for a strong partner for the United States. In terms of the, the other broader issue that you raised about the, the various uh, issues, challenges in the U.S.-Turkey relationship, uh, there continues to be a broad-based conversation between Washington and Ankara um, across a, a range of issues. Uh, Libya, for example, hasn't stopped because of COVID-19. Syria hasn't stopped because of COVID-19. We need to continue uh, to talk through, work through some of the issues that are associated with these two uh, defining challenges in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, we have done so through uh, the outbreak. Uh, we will continue to do so going forward. Uh, and Turkey continues to be a vital and important strategic partner for the United States. And if I could uh, ask you a follow-up question. Uh, again, I mean, of course, uh, these are not easy questions, but where do we stand regarding uh, the CATSA sanctions? Because just before the pandemic uh, broke out, everyone expected that the sanctions would be imminent. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, Turkey, of course, postponed uh, the activation of this uh, S-400 system. Uh, but but where do we stand right now? Is, is there a window for, for opportunity? What I can tell you is that we remain deeply concerned about the acquisition and potential activation of the S-400 system. Uh, we continue a dialogue with our Turkish partners about our concerns uh, and, and ways in which we hope that Turkey would be in a position to address those concerns. As for Katsa sanctions, that's an ongoing deliberative process. I can't preview for you any potential outcome of that process, but uh, the fundamental underlying drivers of that, the U.S. concerns about the S-400, uh, continue to be uh, on the front burner. Oscar, do you have any other questions you want to ask before oh, we turn you, to sir. general questions? Thank you, okay. All right. Uh, Matt, thank you. I just want to let you know we received a number of questions both on the, in the areas that Gordana and Osger um, sort of mentioned, even before the event, uh, coming from Europe, but also the U.S., some coming from the Hill as well, which I know you're probably dealing with a number of Hill-related questions on these issues. Uh, one of the questions that, that uh, came earlier was really about how, how the U.S. is responding to both, uh, both Russia and China in these regions and the increase in both disinformation, but activities, and maybe to provide a little bit more color uh, in response to that, how the U.S. is responding, how it works with allies uh, to respond to this. Because I think there was, uh, Gordana mentioned this period in which, you know, we were all, I think many countries, including the U.S., are really inward looking domestically at how to respond, which I think is very appropriate for countries, but it was also the moment where you had um, airplane diplomacy and whether it was uh, China flying in certain materials or Russia, even if, even if the backdrop was that the countries were actually paying for the ventilators or PPE, regardless, um, it was a moment where I think there was this concern about that, that the US and frankly, that, that, that the United States and other, the West, the United States, the EU and others were really not moving quickly enough to support um, 
uh, partners. And I think that's not the case. And, and COVID-19 is clearly not a just a sprint on the health side, which it is a sprint to address those challenges. It's going to be a long-term challenges for countries to recover. But maybe you could just speak to how you're approaching it. And this is a diverse region um, where China is trying to seek greater investment for Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and we know that comes with more strings than most people realize when that type of investment happens. But how is the U.S. approaching these very difficult issues of, of, of activities that have been taking place? And that was one question that was posed. I have one um, a little bit more specific to, um, to a country, which is Kosovo. Somebody uh, posed a question that says, when will MCC be restarted in Kosovo? So one is a really big the, the big issue of sort of China, Russia, and I had one smaller question, maybe if I could add there too, we've got a number coming in right now um, related to Kosovo and MCC. So I know it's a little, little bit balanced. Thank you, over to you, Matt. Sure, terrific, thanks for that. Um, I think what I would do is, is uh, divide my response into two, one to focus on the issue of disinformation and, and the second to focus on this issue of what I will call performative assistance, right? Uh, in the area of disinformation, we've had a, a long-standing uh, engagement across this regional space in the Western Balkans and the Aegean, trying to help the countries uh, grapple with this challenge of misinformation, disinformation, a um, bunch of crap that swirls around the, in cyberspace or that may be more specifically and deliberately targeted uh, to affect particular dynamics uh, across these regions. Um, we've supported through the Global Engagement Center the uh, exposure of particular misinformation and disinformation campaigns. We've worked with the countries of the region to strengthen their capability to identify the stuff that's out there in the form of, of misinformation, disinformation, and be in a position to call out for their publics what it is. Uh, this is not a one-off. This is not a capability that we are all of us going to need to focus on uh, develop, build on, because Russia and China have demonstrated they have no shame in this area, and the Russians in particular have been been practicing the art of disinformation for for many years. They're quite skilled at it. Uh, it's a particularly dark art form, uh, but it's one where they've had some some success over the years in uh, facilitating building up tensions, distrust. Uh, building up walls where, where people should be building bridges. Uh, it's been of concern to us for some time. And I think in the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen those concerns really come to the fore. What's very encouraging is the extent to which the countries, the governments of the region are aware of this as a challenge, focused on it, and interested in building up the ability, the capability to counter these false, misleading, damaging narratives. In the case of uh, the kind of performative assistance that we saw early on in the crisis, look, no, nobody is gonna say that high quality assistance provided without strings is in any way a bad thing. There's, there's room for a lot of people to make real contributions to this. I don't think that's what we've seen in the case of either Russian or Chinese assistance. Some of this assistance, as you noted, is not actually assistance at all. It's commercial deals um, disguised as assistance some of it, frankly, was of questionable quality. And we've seen plenty of reports across the uh, European continent of the Chinese providing quote unquote assistance that turns out to be substandard, subpar, not what it was labeled as being. And if you can't trust the quality of what you're getting, that calls into question the ability of countries to integrate this kind of, of so-called assistance into their, their response planning. Um, I do understand, we understand the public diplomacy value of airplanes with flags on the tail landing and the early stage of a crisis to unload boxes. And sometimes it doesn't matter what's in the box. It only matters that there's this visible demonstration of support and assistance. And I think there's arguments to be made that the response on the part of the West, on the part of the United States, on the part of Europe was not as, uh, as quick uh, not as speedy as it could have been or should have been. But I think now you look at the totality of what it is that the United States and the EU are doing and providing assistance and support for these countries and it dwarfs anything that the, the Chinese or the Russians may be doing. Here again, I think 
the countries in question, the recipients of this assistance probably could do a better job of highlighting it. Um, the vast majority of this is coming from the European Union. It's measured in billions. Uh, and it, it, it puts, I think, in the shade anything that Beijing or, or Moscow is prepared, able, or willing to do. And here I would also underscore that one of the reasons why all this assistance is necessary is because Beijing from the very beginning didn't come clean, that they, they were not willing to, to share with the rest of the world what they knew about this disease, what they knew about what it was doing in China. They hid it, they disguised it, they, they refused to be transparent and upfront about the nature of the challenge, and we are all of us paying that bill today. So whatever it is that the Chinese might offer this region in terms of support or assistance, I think it pales in comparison to the damage that they've already done. Um, turning to the specific issue of the MCC, um, I don't wanna speak for, for the MCC itself. The MCC is an uh, independent uh, authority, uh, but my understanding is that what the MCC is looking for is a demonstration on the part of uh, the Kosovo authorities that they are, are interested in uh, pursuing broader uh, economic uh, opening up, uh, that they're committed to supporting the kind of uh, commerce and trade that provides for, for jobs and economic development. Uh, and here what we see want to see is not just the suspension of the tariffs, but the removal of those uh, reciprocal measures that were, have been put in place and those that have been threatened to, to put into place. Uh, and my hope is that we'll see early progress on those issues uh, and that MCC will be restored to full functionality in short order. I can't give you a date or a timeline, but I do understand the goal here of ensuring that, that Kosovo is not just looking to MCC for support, but doing everything that it can do and it should do to create a climate of economic growth and opportunity. Thank you, Matt. I, Gordon, I saw you had two fingers raised, so I didn't know if you wanted to come in on something. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, Matt, about uh, how would you comment on, I've been reading lately quite a lot about, um, you know, the EU-US relations maybe not being um, at their best. Uh, also, the relationship between Germany and US not being at its best. And how would you comment um, on the uh, uh, for example, uh, there were headlines in, in German news that maybe we will have to pick between China and US. Uh, why is this and, and how, how do you see it evolving? And, you know, it's just um, a disturbing, uh, so to say, um, headline for someone who lives in, in the region where I live. Um, I, you know, I, I've, I've read those headlines and I, and I want to respond to the headline of the day. I think a lot of it is sensationalist claptrap. Um, the United States and the European Union, the United States and the member states of the European Union are partners and allies. Uh, that is a fundamentally different kind of relationship than whatever relationship uh, these countries and that institution may have with, uh, with Beijing. In terms of the quality of the relationship, uh, let me answer you by, by just highlighting the quality of my relationships, my conversations with my European partners, my European friends, uh, on the issues that I work on, the Aegean and the, the Western Balkans are, are all quite positive and cooperative and constructive and we want the same things. And it, it really is, I think, a, a highlight of transatlantic cooperation and an area where, where we value the partnership. And I have, have built up uh, partnerships and friendships over many years that, that I I value personally and that I value professionally in terms of uh, making it easier to navigate through a pretty challenging thicket. I think in the Balkans in particular, we've seen over the years that where the United States and the EU are working hand in glove in partnership in a cooperative spirit, we can accomplish great things. Man, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you spoke to that issue because there is uh, obviously this tremendous cooperation and there has been for years. Uh, in the region. So hopefully that remains a focus and that sounds like it will. Um, I wanted to bring in just a couple of other questions that are sort of directly connected um, to this, to the region <clears throat> and to some of the issues that you spoke about, which is, um, and I think one question that we have uh, dealt with democracy and how do, how does the U.S. 
move the needle forward. And I'm looking at this sort of entire region. I mean, uh, the two regions, Aegean, and then also, uh, also the Western Balkans. Uh, we had one question that sort of popped up earlier um, that was sent to me about democracy, some concerns when, when uh, there was a recent report, Nations in Transit report, uh, looking at countries across the region. Serbia was one that's been, it's not highlighted because the Nations in Transit report focuses on the entire uh, Western Balkans, but it also focuses on Eastern Europe. That you're seeing this trend, this democratic backsliding trend. How, how can the U.S. Uh, best support and engage to ensure that, that countries in the region, particularly under the fog of COVID-19, aren't doing things that necessarily harm democratic progress um, but also that, you know, this is also impacting, I saw somebody write in a question about independent media. How do we best strengthen indep independent media? So I look at those as, as sort of two parts of the same thing. You need independent media. Democracy is, you know, is important for transparency, combating corruption. So how, is, how are you looking at this and how are you approaching, particularly at a time, uh, such a difficult moment where countries are obviously having to take certain measures uh, needed internally to address COVID-19. We're, we're, we're a couple of months into this now too, um, but keeping that train going because in order for countries to integrate and not all want to integrate into NATO, not all want to integrate into the EU, some are already members um, of, of, these, of these bodies, but how do you keep, that, keep that, that progress going? And it's always been a US uh, value in this region to help move these countries forward on these issues. You touched on it at the beginning, but it, it seems to be particularly acute and has for the last several years when you've seen the needle sort of moving in the wrong direction uh, from where countries should be. So I'm just, it's, it's a big question to ask um, and there's no immediate answers, but I wanted to get a sense from you how the U.S. and how you're approaching this issue, uh, both from the U.S. perspective and with partners. Sure. I mean, thanks for that, Jonathan. And, and just to underscore that the United States remains deeply committed to democracy, to human rights, to media freedom to good governance. Um, that has been true. It continues to be true even through the pandemic. It will be true after the issue of COVID-19 is uh, eventually, hopefully soon, in the rearview mirror. Um, there's a couple of things that we do, different ways that we approach this. Uh, some of this is programmatic. We have specific assistance programs that are geared towards supporting the kind of institutional frameworks that are essential to transparent, democratic, and accountable governance. Um, over the years, in the Western Balkans in particular, we've invested literally billions of dollars in this uh, and, and millions more to come. Uh, this has been a priority for us. It remains a priority. Uh, in the space of uh, supporting independent political parties and, and independent uh, media voices, we approach this in a couple of ways. Some of it is, is again, programmatic capacity building. Some of it is about treating um, politicians who are in opposition as serious players, meeting with them, um, giving them the, the opportunity to, to be seen and to be heard, uh, encouraging those parties that might choose to, to stand on the sidelines, to get in the arena and to compete for, for political position and political influence, highlighting for the countries in question the importance of ensuring a positive media environment for advancing on their European path, and then holding them accountable when they fall short of those standards. So it's an, it's an ongoing, long-standing challenge. Um, I understand the concerns about the, what has happened over just the course of the last couple of months, in particular with respect to emergency measures that have been put in place. I think we've already seen, including in the example of, of Serbia, that some of these emergency measures have been rescinded. Um, it is important that countries uh, not take advantage of the, the pandemic to, to put in place long-term changes that would run against the grain of, of democratic practice. Uh, that's something that the United States will highlight, call out, and, and pressure countries to address if they, uh, if they don't do so. It's important for establishing a firm, strong partnership with the United States, and it's very important for establishing a clear, unobstructed path forward to European integration. Thank you. Um, and I, I know there's some other questions related to that, too, but I wanted to jump to, to an Eastern uh, Med question, Turkey, Greece. 
Uh, one of the questions posed was that there has been uh, obviously ongoing tensions between Turkey and Greece. Um, and the question was really, how is the U.S. playing a role um, to, to ensure that, that the particular situation between Turkey and Greece, and there's sort of a number of issues on the plate, and there has been, um, does not uh, blow up into something more significant? And what role are you playing and others uh, in the U.S. government to ensure uh, that there is um, stability and sort of calm uh, between the two, two NATO partners? Sure. There is a, a constant ongoing dialogue with both uh, Ankara and Athens uh, about these issues, and the United States is actively engaged with our allies uh, in trying to de-escalate tensions. I myself, uh, my last overseas trip uh, in, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was late February, early March, uh, was uh, to Alexandropoli, among other places, near the, the Greek-Turkey border. Uh, I spoke there about the, the pressures that were being applied on the Greek border, on the Turkey-EU border, uh, and encouraged uh, Turkey to work to, to de-escalate those tensions. Uh, we have since seen the tensions on the border de-escalated. There have been uh, challenges with uh, overflights by Turkish aircraft that the Greek government has highlighted. And here again, we're, we're working with our partners and our allies to promote uh, dialogue, to promote responsible management of areas of disagreement, and to work to, to de-escalate points of friction before they evolve into crises. This is, again, not, not a new issue. This is something we've dealt with over many years. Some of these points of friction are of long standing. Thank you. Uh, we had a, uh, one of the questions that came in um, through the Q&A was about, it was Turkey, Russia related, but it also goes, highlights the, how challenged the U.S.-Turkish relationship has been. Um, and I'm just, from, from your perspective, is this, is this a moment, Oscar raised uh, the potential for a, a swap, which I understand that you can't necessarily speak to because that's sort of ongoing conversations or uh, you can't speak to whether it will happen or not. But are we, is there a moment right now, obviously, the, the person who poses the question is saying, are you concerned about the growth of the Turkish relation, Turkey's relationship with, with Russia at the expense of sort of the United States and the West? And how do you, uh, you know, move the needle forward on the relationship with Turkey right now in order to ensure that it remains strong? Is there an opening right now, uh, given the current situation? Obviously, Turkey's economy is in incredibly difficult shape. Um, and uh, the country has been hard hit by COVID-19, but it was also in a difficult political, excuse me, a diff difficult economic situation even before COVID-19. Maybe you could just speak to that. Uh, I'm sort of wrapping in a couple of questions that I received on an email sure. and then also uh, coming in together, because I think it, it fits with this question about the future of the U.S.-Turkish relationship and how you and sort of the administration are viewing it and how to, how to build it up and to ensure that, that the malign actors that, that, that you express concern about um, don't alter uh, this important relationship and take it in a direction that, that's harmful both to U.S. interests and I frankly think to, to Turkish interests as well. Thank you for that, Jonathan. I think the first thing that I would do is underscore that the United States and Turkey are allies. That is a, a fundamentally different relationship than the relationship that Turkey has with Russia. There are, are certain areas where Turkey is pursuing an accommodation with Russia, or Turkey is looking to expand or deepen cooperation with Russia. That's obviously of concern to us, uh, including in particular in the area of the acquisition of Russian military hardware, um, which is, I think, inappropriate for a NATO ally and something that that, that puts uh, the United States and Turkey in a position where where there will be inevitable frictions and tensions. Um, I think at the end, uh, the Turks are going to be disappointed in the quality of the relationship they have with Moscow because the, the Russians don't have relationships on the basis of equality. They, they, they don't do that. Um, Russia will, at the end of the day, betray Turkey's trust. Um, I expect that in particular to be particularly clear in the case of, of Syria. Uh, there is a fragile ceasefire in place in Idlib right now, but, but it is not our expectation that it will last. Russia has violated uh, every ceasefire agreement that it's made. Uh, the, the Syrian government under Russian influence 
has violated the terms of every agreement that it's, it's reached. Uh, their interests and Turkey's interests do not align. Uh, I think Turkey is, uh, understands that. Uh, I think they are increasingly coming to understand that, not just in the case of Syria, but uh, in particular now in the case of Libya, where Turkey and Russia find themselves on, on opposite sides. That is, is a clear and obvious point of tension and friction between Turkey and Russia. Uh, there are areas where Russia can apply pressure to Turkey, and they're not shy about using it, including energy, uh, trade, tourism, once the, the COVID-19 stuff again kind of dies down. Uh, the, the fundamentals of the Turkey-Russia relationship will, will push them apart in the same way that the fundamentals of the U.S.-Turkey relationship will hold us together. Uh, so I, I don't want to downplay or minimize the challenges in the relationship. There, there are challenges. Uh, there have always been challenges. There's, you know, a temptation to look back to this golden past of the U.S.-Turkey alliance when, when there, were no, there was no friction, there were no problems, there were no challenges. That's a misreading of history. Uh, we've navigated those challenges in the past. We are navigating them in the present, and I'm confident that we will navigate them going forward successfully. Thanks. Matt, can I ask you a quick question? This is more housekeeping. Thank you. I, I was looking at the time and I noticed we're at nine. We have a few more questions. Do you have 10 minutes? And, and if you don't, I totally understand how busy your schedule it is. Um, do you have 10 more minutes to, to hang the with German us? Marshall Fund. <laughs> thank you. Much appreciated. Um, if I could just, and thank you for that answer. And I, I think there was a, you know, one question that I that we had, and if you're you can't see it, but we've got a bunch of questions up on the Q and A screen too. Uh, one is about Libya, which you've talked about. Whether you think that is a moment for where the U.S. might be, uh, the U.S. and uh, and transatlantic partners might be more willing to support the Turkish position. Uh, complex issue. News breaking yesterday of Russian military and jet. I mean, Russian jets, uh, planes in in Libya supporting. Uh, sort of their, their, you know, backing up uh, their side. They're including, you know, mercenaries, what people perceive as mercenaries, Wagner mercenaries. So my question to you is on that, based on what was asked, was whether there's a moment where you might see uh, a more common approach to Libya. It's a complex situation, um, rife with a lot of deep challenges um, over the last uh, several years, clearly, uh, if there's an opportunity there. And I also just wanted to um, it's the 25th anniversary, and I'm, I'm going to take you from uh, from Libya to to uh, to Bosnia. Um, it's the 20th anniversary of the Dayton Peace Agreement, and a, one question was posed: whether Matt, whether you see an opportunity for uh, U.S. EU initiatives in Bosnia regarding constitutional changes, electoral reform, Mostar, uh, et cetera. So uh, maybe yeah, I know I'm having you swing from one place to another, but we have a lot of great questions, and I know we won't get to all of them, but uh, maybe those two we could ask a little bit if you see an opportunity in Libya uh, for closer cooperation with Turkey, uh, and then also the question about Bosnia on this anniversary. Um, you know, I'm not the Libya guy, so I'm, I'm reluctant to go into too much detail about this, but just to underscore that in, in Libya, we, we support uh, a ceasefire, the de-escalation of tensions. We support the UN role uh, in promoting a political settlement uh, in Libya, and, and we are committed to working with uh, all the parties in, in support of that goal. Um, the United States and Turkey, obviously, we have an ongoing conversation about Libya, uh, but I don't really want to go into, into too much detail again because it's a little bit outside of my lane. Uh, broadly speaking, what we're looking at is uh, an end to hostilities and a return to a political process. In, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, certainly the United States and the European Union are working well and closely together in pursuit of the goal of a functional Bosnia-Herzegovina, a Bosnia-Herzegovina that produces results for its citizens, a Bosnia-Herzegovina that is implementing and instituting the kind of reforms that are necessary to a European future. Um, there have been some successes. Uh, I think the U.S., European partnership in promoting the compromise that made it possible for Bosnia-Herzegovina to submit its, its uh, uh, annual national program to, uh, to NATO uh, was a step in the right direction. 
we've seen some movement on the issue of Mostar, but, but this is an area where I, I would reinforce the importance of the political class making the compromises necessary to enable uh, the exercise of uh, free democratic practice. It's been more than 10 years since Mostar had elections. That's uh, unacceptable. It's unconscionable. Uh, and it's important that the SDA and the HDZ in particular find common ground, stop holding the people of Mostar hostage, uh, allow for free elections in Mostar and the formation of the assembly and the, the election of a mayor. Uh, this is something that the people of Mostar deserve. It's something the United States is committed to. It's something we're working well and closely with our European partners in pursuit of. Um, on the broader question of reforms, yes, in principle, um, but it's gonna take some time. Uh, and what we need to see is a demonstrated willingness on the part of the leadership uh, in the Federation, in Republika Srpska, at, at all levels, to make these kinds of compromises that are, are necessary demonstrations of leadership. I'm more encouraged by some of what we're seeing at, at local levels than what we're seeing at the national level. Bosnia-Herzegovina, clearly, there's a lot of work to do, but we're committed to this partnership. We're committed to working together with our European partners to advance the goal of a stable, prosperous, democratic European Bosnia-Herzegovina. Thank you for that. Thank you for that response. And, and um, I think I'm going to, there was a number of questions regarding Libya that I think just based on sort of your needing to, con, con, to talk specifically with obviously your counterparts who are dealing with this directly that we, we may not get to, uh, to all those questions. I think, we, I think there's about 10, 10 Libya related questions. In the you got to get the board. NEA guys in here to talk Libya. <laughs> we'll, 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 we're going to turn, we're going to turn to the next, but it, it's clearly something that, that, uh, that many of those who are watching, and I know uh, my colleague Osgur will be hosting, uh, uh, is, is going to be focusing on that, this issue this week. But uh, also, you know, there's a number of questions related to <coughs> Kosovo, Serbia, and about, um, about the U.S. policies and positions going forward. Um, partially, some questions related to the internal dynamics in Kosovo uh, with the president and prime minister, but also um, how the U.S. is going to approach this issue. Some You'll see some comments regarding saying the U.S. shouldn't be pushing as hard on, on Kosovo, um, those suggesting that perhaps uh, the timetable is too, trying to push a timetable. I appreciate you said that you take it, I, I heard you say it's almost like day by day, move this process forward. But is there any you know, sort of final thoughts? Because it's, it's obviously, it's filled up the inbox uh, coming to me today. And I think there are a lot of people who want to see uh, the Balkans sort of from the macro level move forward on Euro-Atlantic integration. They want to see the, the Serbia-Kosovo issue in the right space moving forward because that's key to moving this region forward. I don't have to tell you, you've been in this region working to try to, to move the needle forward I, and instrumental also, I think, thank you in moving the PRESPA agreement forward, both you, this administration, uh, putting North Macedonia in the right space has become a NATO member and on track uh, for, you know, for the EU. And so is there anything you really want to speak to? I, mean, I think people are asking, how, do you, how are you going to move this ball forward? So many complex pieces to it, uh, different personalities. Um, the EU also has uh, an envoy appointed, Mr. Lajcek, who's also been appointed to this. And some different opinions coming from spaces from Berlin to Brussels and Washington. Um, and I just, I wanted to give you the floor to answer because it, it, it's filling up a lot of the inbox space for the Q&A. Uh, and I think people are sort of wondering how this ball moves forward. Yep. Uh, I understand that. Um, it's a difficult, challenging problem set. I mean, it has been for, for quite some time. I, I really don't have anything new for you on this. Just again, to underscore that it's, it's up to Kosovo and to the, the political leadership in Kosovo working through institutions um, on the basis of the Kosovo constitution and the legal framework for the country to resolve the current political impasse, put in place a government that is empowered and accountable and ready to engage in the dialogue process. Uh, and, and then I'm, I'm hopeful that the parties will get back to the negotiating table and start negotiating seriously the path forward to 
uh, normalizing the relationship. And I'm, I'm not going to here look to define what that is. Um, but right now, what we're focused on is trying to help Kosovo uh, open up the economic space, uh, trying to create opportunity for the people of Kosovo, trying to help ensure that, that Kosovo young people understand Kosovo as a place where they have a positive future, where they can raise their families, where they can, can get a good job, where they can establish themselves and be successful. Uh, so we're working to promote that kind of economic growth, working to promote that kind of economic opportunity, and working to keep the political class focused on moving forward, meeting their obligations, meeting their responsibilities, uh, and doing so within the framework of Kosovo's constitution and Kosovo law. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, we're, we're, we've reached our sort of additional 10 minutes. Gordana and Oscar, I was gonna ask if you had any final thoughts uh, and then uh, we were gonna conclude. Gordana, can I just send it over to you for any final thoughts? Yes, well, thoughts are questions. Thoughts, <laughs> thoughts well, at this point. I, gotta, I, gotta, <laughs> yeah. I, I know, uh, okay. we, we've got no time. Thank you, Matt. No, uh, well, the, the final thought is that I am really thrilled with the fact that um, despite uh, this pandemic and despite that it has um, hit us all very hard and U.S. Uh, as well, um, we uh, are glad to, you know, see that the involvement of the U.S. government in the region, not only that it has not uh, weakened, it actually um, has been strengthened. Um, um, and there is, um, there is, you know, more involvement now than, let's say, a year ago. So uh, for me, this is uh, a positive development in the right direction. And I can only, you know, hope that um, it remains this way. Uh, because if there is anything that we we need now is um, is our traditional, so to say, partners, um, and and uh, that that you know we do not become the victims of um, uh, malign influence, so to say, in in a fragile uh, times as as now. So that's it. And my I'm keeping my fingers crossed that U.S. gets also more involved in resolving the bilateral disputes or issues that are still challenging this region. Thank you. Thank you. Oscar? Uh, well, let me first thank Matt uh, for very insightful remarks. I mean, my two take takeaways from today's conversation is, first of all, this pandemic has only reinforced uh, the, our, our mutual need uh, for all of our countries to cooperate and coordinate. Uh, and second, the world continues to evolve. I mean, issues that now we are not talking about, uh, we'll be talking about them again uh, soon after the pandemic is over. Thanks, Oscar. Matt, thank you, Oscar. And just on behalf of the German Marshall Fund, Matt, thank you. You've been so gracious with your time this morning and a busy schedule. Um, and you've covered a tremendous amount of ground. We look forward to another conversation with you. Um, and, and hopefully we can uh, jump deeper into some of the specifics, regional questions, whether it's Turkey or partnerships with Greece that we didn't get a chance to really speak to in Cyprus, but also talking more about, about the Balkans. But again, thank you so much for joining us and also uh, just sharing with us what you are doing, what the U.S. is doing. And I want to echo what Gordana is saying, too, that I think it's, it's really important um, to highlight that, that, in effect, the U.S. is even stepping up even further its work and engagement with partners in the region. And we appreciate, you know, I, I know I, I do as uh, having someone come from U.S. government, appreciate the, the hours and effort that have been put in by you and your colleagues in Washington, but also uh, both in, in, whether it's Belgrade or Ankara. Um, and we really appreciate the work that they're doing to, to engage, but also not only support the U.S. interests, but also support the health and well-being of citizens of, of all these countries in a region that, that numbers over well over 100 million. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and you know, we, we look forward to our next conversation. Thank you to my colleagues in Ankara and Belgrade. And thank you for everybody who's joined uh, this morning or afternoon um, in the United States, Europe. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for this opportunity. And, and thank you uh, for a great conversation to, to all involved in some terrific questions. We appreciate Definitely. it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.